Hello and welcome to another episode of the Coach Kelly Speak Show. I'm your girl, Coach Kelly. I'm live at the Listen Vision Studios in this fabulous studio in Washington, D.C., right here on the campus of Howard University. I'm so excited. I don't know which show this is, but I believe that it's like my 30th show. And I'm so excited. I'm so, so excited. It's just amazing um, to me, just everything that has just been going on and launching in 2017. And so I wanted to just personally invite you to the PK Girls Push Into Purpose Christmas Party. We're going to have an amazing time. We're going to, listen, ladies, you have to be there. If you want to bring your husbands, we have opened it up. Um, if you want to bring a guest, you can, your boyfriend, fiance, um, whatever. You can bring someone. It's going to be absolutely amazing. You can also um, drop off your toys. Toys. A lot of people have been asking me where to drop off their toys for the tour drive, and we are going to um, we are going to um, send the toys to Haiti. We're so excited, my mom and oh. Also, my mom is launching her very first book project. Um, her whole entire book is about motivational gifts. I was trying to get her to get on here today because this book is going to be off the chain. I cannot wait. Make sure you are SVP um, for the toy drive. It is for Tree Angels for Haiti. And so you can drop them off 6500 Old Branch. Avenue, Camp Springs, Maryland, Sweet B. You can drop your toys off, making sure that they're new toys. We do want to make sure that the kids are getting new toys. Um, if you want to wrap it, you can. Um, no, nope. okay. My director just said that we unwrap toys. <laughs> so, so, so. I'm so excited um, <clears throat> because I believe that this is just a season of just unifying and collaborating and just really uniting as a people. I have been reaching out to so many different people, authors and speakers and just different people for 2018, which I have declared, well, God has declared that 2018 for the Coach Kelly Speak Show will be the year of unity. I believe that this is a season for us to unify and stop competing with each other and stop completing each other and go into a next level in unity. I believe that this is a significant season in the world, not just in the DMV area, but I believe that without unity, we are not going to be able to do those things. Unity is where God has commanded his blessings. And so we want to unite and we want to take over for the kingdom. Okay. And so I'm going to, uh, what else, what else, what else? And so I usually do a week of reflections. And so I noticed while I was in the salon that I've had these balloons um, from the wives night out. Now, mind you, helium balloons only last just a few days and it's been literally 30 days and these balloons are still going. I'm going to take a picture if just believe it or not, those balloons are still up and it was really amazing to me when I was just thinking about it, how those balloons are really up because of the grace of God, because helium balloons do not last an entire month. But for me, it was significant because oftentimes in your relationship, you want to know what is holding you up. And I really believe that the grace of God is the only thing that can hold you up in any relationship. And speaking about unity, um, back in September, I started a, um, if you will, kind of like a revolution, um, talking about relationships, the power of friendships, how I personally believe that friendships are a ministry. I believe that we are called to the level of friendships. Some people, they're in your life. You cannot get them out. No matter what you do, they will not leave you alone. And I believe that those are covenant relationships that I believe God has called us to to help one another. I believe, and I, I use my relationship with my best friend 
as an example because with our relationship we help each other we push each other to the next level starting out we had an event called don't call me sis event because a lot of times we self-proclaim each other as sis and a lot of times when the rubber meets the road and we need each other the sis is not there and so this year i was encouraging relationships that if you call me sis be there for me, have my back, you know, and be there in the thick and the thin. And then we segued into the relationship with marriage. And so I'm so excited to announce that we're having a singles retreat February the 23rd through the 25th. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Just plugging our special guest. She's going to be there. I'm so, so excited. Dr. Don Harvey, amazing woman of God. I cannot wait. I wanted to make sure that it was no other guest on today because her story is amazing. Um, she she got me when I first met her, just hearing her story about just all of the things that she went through as a woman. I'm going to let her tell her story, but I'm so, super excited. And we're going to take a quick commercial break. And after that, we're going to have Dr. Don Harvey. Hello, everyone. It's your girl, Coach Kelly from the Coach Kelly Speaks Talk Show. I'm here to talk about my brand new book, The 30 Day, 30 Minute Visionary Journal, Awakening the Finisher Within. I wrote this book because I wanted to inspire other people to be finishers in their own personal journey of business and everyday life. So writing this book has really helped me to organize my thoughts a lot better. And it has also just made me look at things different and not put so much pressure on myself because before I would try to compile so much information in at one time, but now it has slowed my pace down a lot and I'm able to really plan things out in a 30 day, in a 30 minute manner. And so I think that now, you know, with different projects that I'm working on, I feel that I'm a little more confident in what it is that I'm doing because I've actually planned it out better. So I hope that people who get this book will have a deeper appreciation for number one, who they are, what they've been called to, and the people group that they've been called to as well. Um, I also want people to have a clear and step-by-step -step guide to how to fight against fear and procrastination. I hope that this book will help you to win in each and every level of your life, each and every area of your life. I want this book to change the way you see yourself. When you look yourself in a mirror, that you won't see yourself through the eyes of fear, but that you'll see yourself through the eyes of faith, knowing that you are a finisher and that you will finish each and every project that you put your hands on. I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you, gracias. <laughs> because without you, I would not be able to do what I do, what I love every day, from styling my clients to the boutique, and now my new show, The Coach Kelly Speaks Talk Show. This has been an exciting journey for me. I'm inspired by each and every last one of your comments, how you share my posts, you know, going on to YouTube, leaving comments, just all of that just warms my heart every time I read it. And so I wanted to just let you know that you can buy my book on my website at www.coachkellyseeks.net. Thank you again for tuning in. And I love you guys so much. Thanks. Welcome back to the Coach Kelly Speak Show. I am here with none other than the dynamic Dr. Don Harvey. Hello, hello. <laughs> Good to see you. Yes, thank you so much for being a part of this. It's such an honor to have you to mm -hmm. share this um, this opportunity and space with you. Um, amazing woman of God, I look up to you. You inspire mm -hmm. me. And um, so, um, tell us about yourself. Oh, gosh. Where do we start? Where do we start? Um, well, first, thank you for allowing me to be on the show. I always enjoy um, ministry fellowshipping with you some kind of way. Whenever we connect, God just shows up, and we share the most amazing conversations and revelations. So I appreciate you for 
having me on. Um, I really came to uh, share uh, my latest book, Marriage Unbreakable, The War Against Divorce. Um, but I think that it's prevalent and relevant in this time because I understand the pitfalls of relationships in a whole, whether it's girlfriends, uh, whether it's you dating and you're single and you're a Christian and you're trying to establish this walk to get married and do it wholly, but still have this attraction in this relationship you're building with this gentleman, you know? Mm -hmm. And then marriage, um, the enemy came after my marriage. I wasn't saved at the time. Uh, it was um, 2002 was when I got divorced. So it's 15 years ago, right after that, I found God and I realized once I found God, all the things that I did in my marriage that did not uphold his word. And I said, you know, maybe I can give some women some tips and some couple some tips. And what began to happen is as our ministry grow, I've been pastoring 10 years now, as our ministry began to grow, we began to counsel couples everywhere. Um, we've only lost one couple and that was to drug addiction. We just could not get him to come out of that situation. He just wasn't willing to do that. And um, one of the husbands said to me, you need to put these strategies in a book. <laughs> you need to, because they're, you know, you can find marriage information everywhere now. You can Google it. But there's something about having lived it. You know, I've been single. I've been married. I've been divorced. I've been in ministry. I've been pastoring. So I've seen all the realms that you can see. Because if someone had told me the heartbreak that comes after divorce, if you weighed out what the divorce cost you, versus the crisis you allowed to get you divorced, wow. you would probably stay married. Mm -hmm. But we never count the cost at that level. And so I'm hoping that the book um, can help some folks through situations like that. Yeah, and so you do you counsel a lot of couples? I do counsel a lot of couples. <laughs> and it's funny because they're all over the United States. I have a couple in Tennessee I counsel today. And it's, it's a joy for me to defeat the enemy as it pertains to love. You know, we know that God is love, that everything that we do in love perpetuates God's kingdom advancement. And so the enemy's gonna come after love. He's, that's why he comes after the sis thing you were talking about, yeah, someone calling you. Yeah. He comes after that because commitment means love. And he doesn't want us to love each other because then we display God's kingdom movement, his advancement in the earth. And so I do get a chance to counsel couples. It's fun. It's also very, um, difficult to help people take emotional responsibility mm. because one of the pitfalls and and this is the holiday season the tagline i'm using right now is love for the holidays and that's yeah. to help couples mm -hmm. you know reconcile or reignite their relationship they're struggling during the holidays it's supposed to be the most romantic time yeah. you're supposed yeah. to be walking in the mm -hmm. snow or down at the monument and you're not even speaking mm -hmm. you know or you're wrapping the kids gift um, christmas gifts separately because you can't even do anything together and it's because you know i think two things emotional responsibility as far as it pertains to really knowing where you are emotionally, where you're well and where you're sick. Right. And then emotional accountability, mm -hmm. knowing how what you've done has impacted your partner. And if we could master those two things, we could annihilate the conflict in marriages, I think. Yeah, and so knowing, like, how, do, how are you able to locate where you are emotionally? The things that are sensitive to you, the things that easily get you upset, or offend you or repeat arguments. Mm -hmm. Usually you need to find the root of the repeat argument. It's usually not what you're arguing about, it's what triggered it. And then if you can resolve the trigger, you can stop the repeat argument and maybe you can start healing from that situation. Yeah. And I don't think we do that. Like who really sits back and says, well, my couples do and they hate it, but <laughs> they hate the process, but yeah. they love the progress, yeah. Yeah. you know? Healing because it's hard. It is hard. Mm -hmm. and and. It's so easy to only remember who did it and how it made you feel. Okay. And so you hold on to that versus actually getting involved in the, in the forgiving process because forgiving is not an emotion, it's a decision. Okay, okay. So okay. people usually hold on to the emotion instead of making that decision. Yeah. So what, so you said something that was so um, amazing. You said forgiveness is a process. It is a process yeah. because you, when you're in that stage <clears throat> of healing from the pain that was caused by the person that you're living with, 
And and what you do is you learn it, it's something, right? You, you're healing that. at the same time that you are living with the person who inflicted the pain that you're healing from. So if you don't come to terms with your emotional state, it is very hard to finish the forgiving process. Yeah, I, I love that. I'm just, I mean, just that alone, understanding that you are healing and then you may run into another situation during that. So it's almost like, that's a lot of work. It is. It yeah, is. that's a lot of work. Now, one of the keys that's funny is really taking advantage of your personal time mm -hmm. so that when you know, okay, if I'm very sensitive when I hear how he communicates with other women because not that I don't trust him, I have forgiven him over time, but I haven't forgotten that he violated the relationship or vice versa. So he might be sensitive when she talks to men. And so if you don't heal in the area that allows you to trust them past what they did, that will always come up at some point in your relationship. You should, it's yeah, like I'm just sitting here just thinking about how when you, and even in a relationship with, say, a friend, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. you know you have that, I guess, elephant in the room, mm -hmm. you know, that you may choose or not choose to acknowledge, but as soon as it seems like it's going back down that road, you instantly, like, cringe again and isolate. Because you are a pain, pain is a constant reminder. Pain is, it's very hard to forget how pain made you feel. It, people um, get nauseous when they're Ooh. heartbroken. Um, they go into isolation, they experience depression. And so for me, um, I didn't realize until the Lord began to open up the word to me, I didn't realize that I was living my relationships out based on the pain I had experienced, not the woman I had become. Wow. And so I had to get in tune with the woman I had become. And we get to choose how we use what happens to us. So if I am saying that I forgive you, then I have to remove or give power to my forgiveness, not my pain. And that was hard for me. So powerful. It was so hard for me. <laughs> it was just really hard for me not to remember that I couldn't breathe when you hurt me. Wow. And now you want me to act like I have an oxygen tank. You know, I couldn't breathe. And so I, I got to the point where I was able to forgive him for, for uh, violating our marriage. So even after the divorce, we were able to co-parent. Um, because pain will stop you from co-parenting correctly. It's not that you don't want the kids to have both parents. It's that your heart is breaking every time you see him because you didn't want a divorce. Wow. I didn't want a divorce. Wow. But I didn't want to be in an emotionally abusive marriage either. So I had to make a choice. Either I'm going to get out of this situation or I am going to be, and, and I had a very good job. I was an operations manager for Federal Express. I had high demand. It was very critical that I be observant based on the motor vehicle requirements mm -hmm. and the transportation requirements. So it was a very stressful job and I could not afford to be emotionally unavailable during a time where people's lives were hanging in the balance based on when they got on the road, when they got off, when the planes were landing, mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. And so I, I had to make a decision and I, I think that that decision led me to answers that other people could use. Yeah, that's powerful. So what did you feel in that you lost? What did you lose in that relationship? You know, I really think, um, because I believe that once you are emotionally accountable, I believe that you can kind of make your life whatever you want, even after divorce. I believe that you can go on and you can thrive. If you have to build alone, you can. I think that um, building together is faster. So I believe I could have progressed quicker, you know, had a, had a faster outcome in my success if I had been able to um, save, salvage that relationship. But more importantly, my children. I wish that um, we could have given them a better um, opportunity as a family unit is what I lost. And so 
Um, I, I wish that I had counted that. One of the activities that I give my clients when they come in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a cost analysis. So they have to write down what they want to get divorced over. Because if you come to me, you're not getting divorced. Like, it's, divorce is off the table. It is not an option. Nobody's getting divorced. Marriage is like an airplane. When it takes off from the runway, no one's getting off. You're not getting off. So if you want someone that's going to give you permission to get a divorce, don't call me because we're going we gonna to make it, okay? Love and that. so... Um, for me, um, I'm, I have them fill out this form and they have to tell me what this critical issue is that causes you to eliminate a life. Because a marriage is like giving birth to something. When you People grieve like someone passed away when they go yeah. through divorce. Yeah. It's like you lost a loved one. And so then I get them to do a cost analysis after your divorce. This is your income. These are the hours you work. This is how many children you have. So if you had to do all of this alone, is this problem worth living like this separately? And 99% of the time, that problem is not worth it. Or the person is not worth it. And that's what usually, we start off with that. Because I, I want them to see the value. I think that the reason we're challenged in relationships is because everything has been so the moral climate has diminished so much that I don't even know if people know what they really have when you can find someone that will ride this life out with you. Mm -hmm. Like the value is not there like it used to be. Like mm -hmm. when my, you know, our, our older generation or grandparents got married, when that happened, oh, no one's getting out of this thing alive. Yeah, I mean, not that real. I'm going to kill you, <laughs> but that someone's going to have to leave here in an effort for that to happen. And so... Um, I just think that the value of having a husband, even if he's under construction, mm. but is willing to do the work. You know, I always say a man is the pilot, a woman is the co-pilot, no matter who pays for the gas. Mm. Because a woman can't cover herself. Wow. She can be in a relationship, but she can't Come cover on. herself. So if he's going to be the covering, then he's the pilot. And if you don't like how he's flying his plane, get off the plane, but you can't take his will away from him. Wow. And so I think that it's just important for us to know the value um, of that happening. And if you can get a woman that will commit to your vision, that is more that is worth more than money. A woman that will truly, you know, uh, sell out to exactly what it is God is telling you to do in your life. A woman that will tell you the truth so you can get better, not to hurt you, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that if we could establish that value, that it would change how we handle each other. Right. You know, because I don't think people think, I'm handling my wife mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I'm handling my husband. Mm -hmm. Who really thinks like that? I, I'm not going to handle my husband like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So so I hope that that works for couples. And I hear a lot of people use the reference of this is not a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. And so what is your philosophy on or what is your definition of a healthy relationship? I, I, would, I would say that a healthy relationship is something where there's a cohesiveness for vision, and each person is clearly defined as to their roles in that, and they are handled appropriately so that they can do that in a positive way. I think a negative relationship is where it is filled with negativity. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, remember the movie, Why Did I Get Married? Yes, yes, so, yes. yes. Uh, we have a healthy couple, so to speak. I guess I don't know if any of them were healthy if you really <laughs> watched the end of the movie, right? But um, it appeared that we had healthy couples, and then we had the two unhealthy couples, which is Tasha and her uh, significant other, and then uh, Jill Scott and her significant other. They were example of uh, they argued all the time, and then they used intimacy as a way to reconnect, but it never resolved the problem because they still always split apart in mm. argument. And a lot of people do that. They argue, but then they use intimacy to reconnect, thinking that that adds a cohesiveness when really you are just delaying the inevitable. And then we have the other gentleman who is constantly making remarks about his wife, but he didn't divorce her. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They, they mm -hmm. went through the yeah. situation where yeah. he had yeah. to because she helped him out. But, mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's unhealthy to be in an environment where it's constantly negative or you can't express yourself. You're walking on eggshells. You can't communicate. And when you do communicate, they misunderstood what, what you said. They, everything they take to heart, which says they are not emotionally responsible. 
because if you're emotionally responsible, then you have identified your triggers and you're working on them. So I don't have to walk on eggshells around you when I talk about money because you already know you have a problem with money. Mm -hmm. You already mm -hmm. know that mm -hmm. money mm -hmm. is messing with your manhood. So mm -hmm. you're not going to bite my head off mm -hmm. when I come talk to you about the bills. But if you haven't taken emotional responsibility that money messes with your ego, every time I bring up a bill, we're going to have an argument over money. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. So you just have to know where, you're, where you need work. And I, I don't think that anyone's ever perfect. You just have to know where you need work so you don't kill your spouse because you have not taken responsibility for your emotional issues. Yeah. And um, we had, um, at my church, we had Reverend Run and his wife. And one of the things that he said was he works to secure his wife. And I'd never heard anything like that before, just knowing, like, if, of course, I'm thinking it's your responsibility to work on your happiness and work on your healing process. Mm -hmm. But then he took and made it a responsibility of the spouse. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I love that. I, I think that it is work. One of the things that I write about in the book is that most people do not serve each other because they're too afraid they will not be served. So it, in conversations, mm. it typically comes up where, well, I just asked you to do this for me, and I can't believe you didn't do that for me, and I just wish you would do this for me. But how many arguments have you seen about I outloved you? So, yeah, that's yeah. good. In, yeah. Our, in our thing, I did we this, a, I did this, I did, I did this, I did yeah, this, I did, I did this. that. <laughs> but not, no, you can't outlove me. Who, who argues about who loves the hardest? Yeah. So we have a thing where there's a trophy and a plaque and each couple gets a magnetic name tag. And so whichever one of them serve the best that month gets the trophy and the other one gets the plaque. Cause of course you're always doing mm -hmm, something mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it becomes a competition because they're no longer worried about getting their needs met. They're worried about serving the other one's needs. And if you're mm -hmm. both thinking that, then everybody gets taken care yeah. of. But typically we don't think that. We think meet my need. But what if your focus was, I'm going to meet your needs so good that you're going to have to, you're going to have to reverence me this month. Give me that trophy. Yeah. Because I, I, I loved you this yeah, month. Yeah, I like it's that. It's just the philosophy about mm -hmm, the relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I've done that even in my own relationship and like, you know, I've done this and done this and done this. And once you think about all of the things that you did, mm -hmm. and if you don't feel like it's reciprocated, then you go into immediate you know, boycott, right. like yeah. I'm boycotting, I'm not doing this and I'm not going to do it. And then it's counterproductive for your relationship. But both people, you yeah. have to have the law of buy-in. Yeah. If both people do not buy into it, then one person will constantly get serviced and the other person will be neglected, which leads to other issues in the relationship. Yeah. And so both people have to make a mutual commitment to love each other the way they would want to be loved, not the style you know, the five love language, but that I would give her the things she needs because I know she's going to give me the things I need. But our mindset is I'm not going to get what I need if I don't fight about it. It is not okay. if I serve what she needs, I'll get what I need, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell the singles too. You need to have all this worked out because you're going to meet someone and he does laundry in the middle of the night. You got to get up at 4 a.m. You didn't think about that. He wants closet space in this old chair. You got this brand new contemporary furniture, and he wants to move in this old recliner. Like, you have to figure those things out, what's important and what's not important, and try to come up with a self-love plan, a relationship end game is what I call it in counseling. Mm -hmm. What do you want the end of this relationship to look like? And if you're dating someone as a single person, especially a Christian, and this person cannot make you have that end game, why are you dating them? Mm -hmm. That's wasting time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So all those things, um, as it pertains to loving someone, um, are important. Yeah, so I'm, I'm noticing now, you know, we talk about having the list, the list, right? How <laughs> real, <laughs> because I've never heard of a man say, you know, I have this list, right? How realistic is the list? And how do you define it? Like, how, what is your take on the list? <laughs> um, well, two things. I, I ministered at a relationship conference about eight years ago. And I actually ministered on men. And I got several scriptures out of the word of God that describes men, that they're wise, they're educated, they're profitable, they're loving, they're God-fearing, they're protectors. And so the Bible really tells you what a good man looks like. You know, it really gives you that 
outline. Um, but I think that men and women, whether they've written it down or whether it's subliminal, have um, designed a list in their mind. And it's funny because the, the initial response is different. We are typically attracted by what they say. They are typically attracted by what they see. Oh, wow. So if they see a woman and they are visually attracted to her, then the list starts. Mm. But unless they work with you and have had one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, the attraction is usually the initial thing that draws them to you, where we are listening for what they say. You can really love a guy, especially if you just meet someone and, and you're mm -hmm. dating mm -hmm. and everything's going good and it's going great and you have and he says one thing and you're like, uh-uh, <laughs> no, no. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh, and so uh -huh. to us, it's what we hear. To them, it's what they see. And it's the same thing emotionally. Once you get in the relationship, they're logical and we're emotional. And so we're thinking about how they made us feel. They're thinking about how we verbalized, how we felt about them and how that res made them, you know, respond to themselves. If it's going to counter, um, you know, compete with their ego or their manhood, then they may not be as receptive to something that we thought we were just saying to help them. So in their mind, they'll be thinking she's never going to respect me and you adore him. But you said something one day about them being like their father. Well, they don't respect their father. They will remember that. Men remember that. Men have great memories as it pertains to how it defines them. Maybe not emotionally. They might not throw things in your face forever. But how it defines them as a man, that thing is in their head. And the, the issue for us as women with men is that very rarely do they say anything because it's already a negative definition of who they are. So they're not gonna remind you that they're weak in that area as a man, but they'll never forget you said it. Wow, wow. We gotta be wow. so careful, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it almost feels like when you hear, of course, when I heard, um, you know, marriage is work, it takes work, it takes work, it takes work, the way you're defining it is work. It is, it is, yeah. but it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth yeah. it. If you, my mother always says, if you can find somebody to ride this thing out with you called life, you need to sign up. Yeah. Because, you know, we, got, we have so much to do on our own. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have a mate to do mm -hmm. that with. Yep. So we're going to take a quick commercial and we'll be right back. give up on their dreams or any part of life? Uh, I think people have a tendency to get up, give up on their hopes and dreams and aspirations due to, some might say defeat, but in defeat there's also a lesson to be learned and I think a lot of times if we draw on the lessons of defeat, it actually can give you enough fuel to overcome any and everything, but ultimately it comes down to just feeling sorry for oneself, having self-doubt, and ultimately losing focus and belief in oneself. So, oftentimes people give up. What do you think the reason is? Um, I feel like people give up because they're scared to fail. And, you know, failure is like a big reason to why people don't try as hard or they don't want to see like the end of result. So I think that's why people give up. Thank you. So why do you think people give up on their dreams? Um, I think people give up because of time and because of listening to other people. They think because if you want to be a singer, you can't make it in that business. So it's really, really hard. Or even when you get older, after a certain age, as a kid, you're in high school. So you have all these big dreams big imagination and you're like okay I can do this I can do that and then you get even older you're in college you're like well I can do this but I can make more money in this and then you're like okay well I kind of got to change it I like this but I'm gonna take a little bit out of it and try my and try my hardest to make some money and then you get even older and you're like I just need to make a living 
So then you kind of give up because you need to survive. You need to make a living. You need to, to, to help your family. And now you have a family. Now you have a house or an apartment or something like that, and you have no money. So it's harder to say, well, I got to chase my dream, but do I eat first? It's a little different. And um, you listen to everybody else. Everybody's telling you, no, 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 no. And you take it and you run with it and you're like, well, maybe it's just not for me. No, it wasn't for them. It's just a little harder, but that doesn't mean stop. Welcome back to the Coach Kelly Speak Show. I am here with Dr. Don Harvey, and we are discussing her amazing book, Marriage Unbreakable War on Divorce. This has been amazing. This first segment was absolutely amazing. I'm like, I cannot wait to go home and read this book. Do you understand? And so this will be one of those things that I'm, I'm going to get it for me and my husband so we can just go through it for the rest of this year um, just to set a course for 2018. I just think that is phenomenal. Mm. And so tell us, what's your favorite chapter in the book? Um, gosh, probably <laughs> um, Mastering the Middle Ground mm. and um, – I, w I would probably say mastering the middle ground and uh, identifying your mate because um, the middle ground is where two people who grew up in two different homes with two different experiences submit themselves to each other's love. And that means that you can either be in great situations all the time or susceptible to heartbreak because once you allow someone in your life at that level, they have the capacity and the ability to break your heart or make you happier than you've ever been. And a lot of people are afraid of that. That's We're that afraid part. of that. Ooh. And so just Ooh. finding a middle ground where they meet your need and understanding what, what that person wants. And then the other one, um, just about knowing who you're married to, knowing exactly who it is that you're with, we have... Um, um, different personality types. And so in the book I talk about the whale, the dolphin, the urchin, and the shark. And I like to use <laughs> animals because they're pretty relatable. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the, um, what is the Myers-Briggs, um, the uh, personality analysis, the sanguine, and the, you know, mm -hmm. like that. And so the shark loves money, the whale loves to help people, the urchin loves information, and the dolphin loves to have fun. And so if you have someone that's a dolphin and they love to have fun, and they marry an urchin, the dolphin is going to express love and say, <laughs> I love you. I want the whole world to know I love you. They're waving a mm -hmm, banner. Mm -hmm. They're posting on Facebook. They have <laughs> pictures. That's, they're just excited. Mm -hmm. Well, an urchin says, I asked you to marry me. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. Wow. So you're married to this person who doesn't express love like that. Woo. But you're this person that's <laughs> waving. You never buy me gifts. I'm always, if I'm in the store, I'm buying you a shirt. In the hands of my love. He like, babe, what time is dinner? But in his mind, the moment he committed to you, nothing's going to come mm. and change that. And if he does say something, then it might be that is over. You know, but if you don't know who you're married to, you know what I'm saying? So you don't know who you're married that to. So you're thinking good. they don't love you mm. like you love them, but you don't know their personality type. You know, one person likes the toilet tissue coming over the roll. The other one likes it coming under. And some just want to just stick it. They only want to put it on the roll. No, they just, they just want to put it on the side. <laughs> and, it, and it annoys you. One rolls up the but toothpaste. The other one squeezes the tube. Ooh. Like, you got to know that, that the dolphin and the shark are probably squeezing the tube because they are going out to play or make money. They don't have time to roll it up. But the urchin who has time and everything has to be laid out, and they know your budget and their budget, and baby, the, all the, see, he paid the bills that month and was excited about it, and that was how he showed his love. Because his father told him, a man takes care of his wife. Mm -hmm. You know, so you got to know, you have to know who you're married to. And so um, those are my, my favorite chapters. And, and I just think it's really important because um, what we'll do is we'll marry someone because we're attracted to them and we like their conversation. But when their personality shows up, we say, I don't even know you. You're different. Well, you never learned their personality. Wow. And you've heard people say mm -hmm, that. Right? Mm -hmm. He's different. Like, no, he was, he was the same guy. <laughs> if you go out to the same <laughs> restaurant you went to before you dated, he's going to act the same way. But mm -hmm. now it's his personality type. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
And so how, I mean, a lot of this information is so good. I'm in it. I've been in it for 13 years. So I know all of these things. I mean, when we dated, I would have never thought any of these things. And that's why it's so important as a single. And this is why um, we're hosting this um, single women's retreat so that we can prepare them for some of those things and just letting them in. And this book is perfect. Um, My wheels are spinning right now. (laughs) Um, This book is perfect because it really gives them almost a backstage pass, you know, into marriage and divorce. Because you're speaking from single, married, and divorced. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that, you know, The goal of the book, um, initially when I wrote it, it was because um, when I was counseling all these couples, I found information, numbers, strategy, even the little tests, which were great, loved them um, and still use them. But these were things that weren't in the book. And I felt like, um, let me just put down what I learned and maybe... The goal is to shorten somebody's learning curve. So I, so if you get married, you don't fight the first three years. Maybe you fight the first six months. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, or mm-hmm. if you're dating, you don't waste two years seeing if this guy's the one. You know in 90 days. And so um, that's why I wanted couples and to avoid the pitfalls of divorce. And I wanted singles to be able to choose the right mate as best they could because there's no sign. You know, my my spiritual mom, you know, when I first decided I was going to start dating again because I didn't date for years, I was like, you know, I just, I know what I want. You know how we are. I know what I want. I know. And she was like, Dawn, when he shows up, there's not going to be a sign over his head. There is no (laughs) sign. And I just have always said that to myself. There is no sign. I have to know in my heart that this person is the one for me. And so I understand. Um you know, recovering after divorce. And I understand now the mistakes that both of us made better than I I did when we were in it because now I have clarity. And I understand what it is to be single and try to maneuver the intimacy waters, the um, relationship water, the financial water, and having a conversation because, you know, in today's society, you're thinking, I'm not going to meet someone and I'm going to be alone. And the truth of the matter is that um, you have to have these conversations if you want to have a successful relationship anyway. Yeah. So why mm-hmm, not mm-hmm, do it up mm-hmm. front mm. so that you cannot waste his time or your time instead of getting so emotionally involved that you settle? Okay. So okay. why not? You're going to have to have it anyway. Okay. You know, December's coming anyway. Mm-hmm. So you might as well buy a coat. You know, the the marriage, if it's coming, it's coming anyway. You might as well know how he feels about um, conversations with other women or relationships with other women. You might as well find out how he feels about money. You definitely need to know what he feels about Jesus. And no, not on the first date and not an (laughs) interview. I'm not saying that. But once you decide that, you know what, I think I want to go somewhere with him, um, and I typically don't share my personal stuff, so you know I don't want no comments about this, y'all that know me on my Facebook Live. But um, the person that I recently um, started seeing when we first started talking, I've known him all my life, and um, and so we just decided, you know, he was like, he's interested. We'll see what happens. But the first thing I said to him is, you know, I'm spoiled. I'm not spoiled <laughs> and selfish, because spoiled and selfish is mean. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I am spoiled, and you know, you stubborn. So can we even take care of each other is what I asked him. Mm. From the giddy up, like, mm-hmm. I don't even want to waste your time. Mm-hmm. And if we're afraid to say that, then that might not be the guy anyway, you know? Because you can pick up what kind of person he you is can. when you meet him as a single woman. Mm-hmm. You can pick up if he's, chival- if it's, if he's chivalrous or mm-hmm. if he's kind of selfish. And if you're okay with that, you might not care if he opens up the car door. You might not care if you have to go Dutch sometime, not all the time, but sometime. But some women are like, no, my father showed me what dating was, so that is not comfortable for me. So you need to know that. Right, right. And so statistically, um, you see um, so many statistics with the women in depression. Mm. And I believe it just crossed all barriers and race. Um, Because depression is such a... 
it's silent. You just would never know. So how would you, what would you say to the woman that um, is depressed during this season? Because I do believe that society romanticizes Christmas. If you see the commercials, it's always the man buying a woman a car. So how do you, what would you say um, to that person? Well, back to the man buying the woman the car, we need that to happen. That absolutely needs to happen. Yeah, buy her the needs. car, buy her the house. She needs a new ring. I'm telling you right now, your wife is looking for some diamonds. You need to do that. Um, but that's another reason why I started this winter tour. I usually kind of relax during the holidays. I stop ministering outside of church um, at Thanksgiving, and I don't typically pick back up till Valentine's Day. But I felt like um, that I wanted to help people avoid the holiday crisis mm. because I do run into a lot of women who say, I hate Christmas. I, and it goes Thanksgiving, family, Christmas, family, love, romance, gifts, New Year's, kiss under the mistletoe, New Year's Eve kiss right in the Valentine's. Mm. So from Thanksgiving to February 15th, a depressed woman is miserable. And um, what I would say, I was kind of talking to um, Farrah on the way over here about that. What I would say about this season is really defining what single means to you. Mm. Because single for me was an opportunity for me to become who I wanted to be without restriction. And then I got a chance to build my life so when I met my mate or meet my mate, when I meet them, I don't have to figure out who I am while I'm dating them. I already know. So it's really about the perception, about being single. What's your perception? And if you truly define what single means to you, single is not lonely. It's really being available. Even if you look at that biblically, Paul talks about how being single gives you an opportunity to be more viable in some mm -hmm, areas mm -hmm. as it pertains to God's will mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about perception. And so I did experience the, I cannot believe I am going to get divorced. I cannot believe, you know, I just, I did go through that. But when I got into the word of God and I, and, and now hindsight being 2020, that is probably what pushed me to God. That is what pushed me to go to church in the first place. Mm -hmm. And once I start hearing and digesting the word of God, I realized that he made me an individual that was a part of a unit. Mm -hmm. But I still had to know who I was yeah. as an individual. Yeah. Because if you apply for a job, you apply for a job in the field of your expertise. So how can you know what kind of man you're supposed to be with if you don't even know who you are as an individual? Mm -hmm. So I really had to figure out who I was and what I wanted. And my definition for single became, this is an opportunity for me to define who I want to be and be prepared for the person I want to love. Yeah. So we have work to do. We do. Yeah. And we're going to get a, it. As a, as a, just in general, we have work to do to work on ourselves as a woman, as a minister, just all of those different things, even in marketplace ministry. At one point, I didn't... I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. I, I separated it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now that it has merged together, oh, let me say this because I don't want to lose that, that that was the reason why um, I guess we decided to have the um, singles, um, the, the singles <laughs> workshop weekend, right? <laughs> the single women's um workshop weekend because i wanted to say we're going to do something in the love month okay we're going to do this retreat because yeah you're posting about you know what i'm going to do for valentine's day but i'm gonna post what i'm going to do in february as well right i'm working on me right. i'm going into um february with the idea that i'm going into boot camp right and i'm going to connect with um Dr. Don, Amen. you know, being there and pouring into the women. Um, after doing the, the wives' night out, the, my inbox was flooded with women. Hey, what are you going to do for the singles? Right, right. Because they want to know, hey, it wasn't on live, you know what I mean? But um, I want to give them the same experience where we come together only um, accepting 20 women. Okay. Um, so I'm going to post a registration on tonight. Um, and it's um, going to be $199. Um, just really just wrestling with and just trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, and just where I wanted to have it and what I wanted to do. And, 
you know, I was like, okay, God, what would I do? Right. You know, what should I do? But God along the way has given me different women that will pour into the woman. So I don't feel like, Ooh, you know, and so today was really, it was, it just sealed the deal for me. Um, me inviting you and not even knowing just, just hearing. Cause we, we talk and we sit, but I was so excited. Like I have her to myself <laughs> <laughs> for an hour. So, you know, it, it, it just lets me know the women have so much to look forward to. Um, and so how can we reach you? Um, you can reach me um, on all social media handles, Dawn M, as in Mary Harvey. Um, my website is dawnmharvey.com. And um, you can visit and, and grab our book. Um, we also have embraceyourgreatness.org, um, which is our, we do so many things. It's a 10-year-old curriculum, Embrace Your Greatness. Um, is my baby. It is a 52-week curriculum with CDs, DVDs, workbook, test kit, and uh, we start Embrace Your Greatness now 11 years ago. We are 11 years and counting, wow. and just um, God had given me the vision that long ago to trademark Embrace Your Greatness, and I'm telling you, I'm glad I did because I've had to fight it, fight over <laughs> it, um, and and I'm just, um, I am determined to shorten people's learning curve in whatever area I can. So if it's in personal development, if it's in their spiritual walk, or in their relationship and their business um, desires, if I can show you what I did and help you do what took me five years to do, help you do it in a year or two years, um, that's my heart's desire. And so those are the areas in which you can reach me. Yeah, that's awesome. So how do you balance everything? You know, it's funny. I was telling, <laughs> I was sharing with her early, and she's like, so what do you got going on tomorrow? I said, well, unlock publishing houses tomorrow. So every day of the week is a business, you know? So Mondays is uh, typically, uh, it used to be my day off and I just, I still end up working. Mondays <laughs> is Embrace Your Greatness. And that's my primary and I might fill in other areas. Tuesday, I work on unlock publishing house. Um, Wednesday, I work on Don Harvey Ministries, have Bible study Wednesday night. And mm -hmm. Thursday, um, I actually get some time to kind of recoup everything else. And then Friday, I have a new company, um, which I've shared the products with you, the mm -hmm. Body Wrap Company. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and then I have awesome people around me. I have a great team. And so we're just um, following God and taking it one day at a time. Yeah, that yeah. is, it, this was, uh, I mean, amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, I'm so excited. So let me ask you this. Where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years? Oh, my gosh. So <laughs> listen here, everybody. And I need your help. I need your help to get the word out. I think that um, for so many reasons, we've all been through different things in our life. I feel like I have um, experienced um, some very traumatic things in my life. But out of every situation, I've been able to develop an aid, whether it's a book or a curriculum for someone else. And I really believe that it's time for us to maximize the platforms. And so, you know, I, I want to be one of the folks who has a opportunity to reach the masses as it pertains to transformation, mm -hmm. as it pertains to getting better financially, getting better emotionally, getting um, better professionally as far as your business is concerned. And I do believe that I have the tools to do that. And so, um, I would love um, to see that fully manifest. I know the Lord has promised it to me. So if you know anywhere that um, we can advance this cause to get the information out, you know, definitely contact me, and I would love to be a part of that. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this project. Um, it's my heart's desire that I continue to be the millennial voice in business mm -hmm. and that I can help the next generation of business owners, speakers, and um, authors to understand the ingredients of success. Mm -hmm. And so um, thank you so much. And so in closing, um, don't forget to go to your website. What's your website one more time? DawnMHarvey.com. Dawn M. Harvey. M. M. As M as in Mary. M as in Mary.com. We put it up on the screen so you can have the information. Don't forget love for the holidays. And also, our Christmas party, Push Into Purpose um, Empowerment events are absolutely amazing. December 17th at the Inspire Clubhouse in Camp Springs, Maryland. Don't forget to drop off your toys for the toy drive. Tree for the, is it, what is it? <laughs> 
Can you put it up? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It is Tree Angels for Haiti. Um, and so we are sending unwrapped toys to Haiti. Um, as you know, um, Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the world. And we, it is our responsibility to take care and help those that are in need. And so thank you so much. Don't forget to register. And it is, I, I am so excited that my mom is doing her book. I am so excited. I'm yes. so happy, Patrina Makins. <laughs> Um, we're going to go live probably after this because I want you to hear from my mom. She is an amazing coach. She helps me and keeps me together. So she's amazing. Love you guys. I will see you on next week on the Coach Kelly Speak Show. Bye.